<laughs> okay, so uh, this just uh, starts out with a little bit of a review of what um, uh, I've been talking about as far as the particular things that I'm looking at, um, uh, the things that started me interested in the direction that I went with my dissertation, the creative process of the artist, the psychology of the artist, artist personae. Um, when it comes to artist personae, um, various kinds of uh, types, um, some of these uh, with religious connotations and the religious connotations being the ones that I'm also particularly interested in. Uh, and um, these different kinds of uh, personae of artists also represented in uh, artist autobiographies, biographies of artists, oftentimes biographies of artists um, could have embellishment. Um, they could uh, kind of take the form of myth and so forth. So various stories about artists, um, including uh, various kinds of mythologies, such as the myth of Prometheus, uh, who steals a fire from the gods and gives fire to humanity, enabling humanity to become inventive and ultimately uh, bringing creativity to humanity. Um, the mythology of Faust, uh, one who sells their soul uh, in exchange for creative powers. So various kinds of um, stories um, about creativity, oftentimes showing uh, religious suspicion, hesitancy toward um, uh, visual art and creativity. Um, the story of the golden calf in the book of Exodus. Um, also ways of <clears throat> thinking about creativity as something that um, is directly given from God, such as this image of Hildegard of Bingen, um, who is a 12th century Benedictine uh, abbess who also wrote and uh, produced illuminations and this image showing um, a little bit strange to show flames going downward, but the flames are coming, um, inspiring her directly that way. Um, I like to bring up this image just kind of further, I think um, kind of ex exemplifies Salvador Dali, um, society's perceptions of artists, artists' perceptions of themselves and um, a tendency of uh, creating these kinds of personas uh, such as this. Um, and then ultimately my theory um, of the relationship between creativity and spirituality, that they can enhance each other and they can also obstruct each other. Um, <clears throat> And so that really brings us where we left off, at least on Monday. Um, and then here is uh, going into further into my dissertation when it comes to the topic of Fritz Eichenberg, an artist that I take as a case study. And in creativity studies, as I mentioned, I was very, very, very surprised coming from art history that in creativity studies, they were just very, 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 very clear uh, about what their theories were, what their methods were, uh, very easy to understand. Um, and one of the methods that they would use was a case studies method, um, which is now this kind of, you know, to back up, uh, ways of studying creativity um, from psychological perspectives, one that uh, they have implemented, and I think I kind of like to use 
um, this or other examples. One example would be um, sometimes um, psychologists, typically at uh, large public uh, research universities, would do things like hooking up wires um, to the the brain and you know seeing what parts of the brain lights up um, at certain points. Maybe have people do drawings or something like that and see what part of the brain lights up. That would be one way. Another way could be um, taking tests. So measuring, try to measure creativity similar to the ways that they have uh, developed an IQ test to try to measure intelligence. So these are different kinds of ways and um, in psychology. There can be a wide variety of different ways. Some of the other uh, psychologists that um, were influential on me were more um, uh, people who would do surveys. Um, and that way they would at least have a larger sample of potential subjects. But there are some in the field of creativity studies who also talk about a case studies method which was the one that I found most uh, suitable to me, which is ultimately um, to create, um, uh, to uh, look at the biography of a particular creative person and kind of pull out what are particular events that would be part of that individual creative development. Um, for me, I also, made a variation on their case studies method. Uh, their case studies method is to look at the biography of the artist to see moments of creativity. For me, I'm interested in the biography of artists and moments of creativity, but also moments of spirituality as well. Um, so uh, there's various points um, and uh, uh, the other thing that um, there's a variety of things that they talk about with the case studies method. Uh, one of the important things here as well is that a case studies method will allow um, to, to see creative development over time. And that was also something that they really emphasize is that creativity can really take a long time, even though sometimes even when we look at works of art, we always say, oh, this work of art came out in 1965, as if like the whole uh, creative process occurred right at that time. Case, case studies method also emphasizes the uniqueness of each creative individual. So creativity um, uh, happens in different ways in different individuals. So. Um, uh, for the case studies method, uh, I um, mine was Fritz Eichenberg, a case study in the relationship between creativity and spirituality. Um, Fritz Eichenberg was born in 1901, um, uh, uh, from 1901 to 1990. Um, in um, uh, he did some writing, um, not really academic writing, um, although he did uh, put together um, uh, basically a textbook, uh, The Art of the Print. But um, in some of his writing, he really credits Francisco Goya and Honoré Daumier as some of his major influences. Um, and um, some of the things that uh, he is particularly interested in, it seems to be with Goya and Daumier, um, were that they were artists who put their lives on the line with courage and conviction. Um, so he is continually drawn to artists who create work that's controversial and um, could get them in trouble. Um, and I think Goya and Daumier are also interesting artists to look at with Fritz Eichenberg as far as the kind of trying to describe Fritz Eichenberg's spirituality. Um, for me, um, it 
could be simple um, to say that, you know, um, you know, I was born Catholic, I was baptized um, not too long after I was born. I went to Catholic grade schools and um, high school, um, became a monk. Um, it's kind of a simple description when we talk about, um, you know, people who are Catholic or uh, whatever the case may be. With Fritz Eichenberg, it's kind of complicated even just to say what his spirituality is. You could say that Fritz Eichenberg was a Quaker, um, but he didn't become a Quaker until he was um, like 39 years old. So um, he was born into a secular Jewish family. So ethnically Jewish, but not really practicing, not really observing. Um, sometimes he describes himself as more Christian than Jewish because he went to Christian grade schools, but at the same time, um, not officially a Christian. Um, and I can see that some of the artists he was influenced by, such as Goya, um, are very, 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 very critical of religion. So the uh, artist that he really upholds, uh, this image here from Goya um, is actually, if you look closely, you can see tree branches. Um, so the idea here, it's a satire by Goya on piety that um, here you put the robes of a religious uh, member of a religious order um, onto a tree, but people aren't looking that closely. They're just enraptured by um, anything that they see as religious. So some of this I think also influences Fritz Eichenberg's spirituality that he very much um, was influenced by artists who criticized religion. On the other hand, probably one of Fritz Eichenberg's um, strongest earlier uh, spiritual influences was Lao Tse, uh, um, uh, who wrote the Tao Te Ching of Taoism, a Chinese religion of Taoism. Uh, so he does credit Lao Tse as one of his early uh, religious influences. Eventually, Fritz Eichenberg became someone who, uh, he was a book illustrator. Um, uh, so as an artist, that is really, uh, most of the work that he produced were for book illustrations. This one is a Heathcliff of Withering Heights. Um, here is an image of the Grand Inquisitor um, from Dostoevsky's Brothers Karamazov. Um, he actually did uh, illustrated quite a bit of works by Dostoevsky, Crime and Punishment, uh, Brothers Karamazov, The Idiot, The Possessed, A Raw Youth, and The House of the Dead. Um, so this is quite a bit of um, the first five here are considered Dostoevsky's five major novels. And then he also illustrated The House of the Dead. Um, as a Jew, um, he uh, really strongly felt that Germany was not going in a good direction. And um, in 1933, really one of the earliest years, um, he uh, and his wife and daughter fled Nazi Germany to the United States, uh, to New York City. It was some 16 years later that Fritz Eichenberg met Dorothy Day, and that uh, becomes a major point in Fritz Eichenberg's spiritual life and also his creative life. Um, Dorothy Day was co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. Um, probably, I think, um, really uh, a, a movement within the Catholic Church that placed very, very, very strong emphasis on social justice and maybe even um, uh, one of the earlier 
kind of uh, uh, movements for social justice within the Catholic Church, um, co-founded with Peter Morin. Um, and so here is um, the Catholic Worker is also known for a newspaper um, that uh, um, is widely distributed. And here is one of Fritz Eichenberg's most well-known images uh, on one of the uh, uh, issues of the Catholic worker. Christ of the breadlines uh, is this image. Um, and so Fritz Eichenberg is really trying to accomplish uh, that kind of mentality of depiction of Jesus uh, in a modern setting and uh, along with the poor. Um, Later, um, Fritz Eichenberg wrote uh, a pamphlet for Pendle Hill, a Quaker publishing company called Artist on the Witness Stand. And so, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I became interested in really getting into the psychology of artists and um, looking at sometimes what artists were writing about when it came to their creative process. And that became interesting to me as much as their work itself. So um, some of what he talks about, about artists, um, he says, uh, artists are witnesses of their time. They reflect the events swirling around them. Um, here, he's really just kind of talking about how so many very, very, very talented artists or other creative people um, are lured by uh, using their talents for advertising for purposes of um, just much more uh, um, opportunities to uh, for work uh, in advertising. Um, and so he is criticizing the kind of uh, way the role of art in society. Um, he says that he's pleading for art with a conscience, for art as witness, for using the gifts we have received by a higher dispensation for humanity's benefit. Um, so again, looking at these different kinds of artistic persona, then um, I uh, specifically then look at uh, the witness that Fritz Eichenberg uh, uh, talks about as one of these kinds of, how would that fit in with other kinds of artist persona? Um, and I think one, some of this now is a further elaboration that I made in a presentation that I gave uh, after my dissertation where I kind of followed up on this particular image, Christ Before the Court in 1955. There's quite a story behind it. And I think this is one of the key images that kind of helped to point in the direction of where Fritz Eichenberg was developing. Um, this is Christ Before the Court. Jesus, again, similar to Christ of the Breadline, an image in a modern context, uh, Jesus in front of the court here, um, that would be similar to um, the scenes of Jesus before Pilate uh, when it comes to uh, the life of Jesus depicted in the Gospels. So in the Gospel of John, uh, there is a point where he is before Pilate and um, Jesus says, you say that I am a king, for this I was born and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Um, so here, um, similar in this scene and the idea of the witness, um, one of the things that was happening at this time was that Dorothy Day and others were protesting um, the kind of uh, air raid drills that were happening uh, in New York City and they would protest. So these um, air raid drills uh, required everyone to basically go into the basements, basically take shelter, 
um, get off the streets. Um, mm -hmm. And so the uh, Dorothy Day and others actually came out onto the streets to protest and actually just went right in front of City Hall and they were arrested. And so um, that really hit Fritz Eichenberg very hard to see Dorothy Day, someone who he really admired and someone who he really saw as trying to work for social justice and things like that, work for uh, um, compassion and um, the benefit of vulnerable people um, to see her arrested was something that really uh, hit him hard. Um, and he felt a bit self-conscious that, you know, he should be doing what Dorothy Day is doing as well, but he has a family and um, he um, is uh, employed with, uh, he is a professor at an art school in New York. And so he couldn't really do that. And he kind of talks about drawing and making art is one way that he can contribute to their cause. Um, here, um, okay, I'm just gonna kind of keep going. And 